Okay, good morning once again. And uh, morning, thank you for uh, being here, all the online as well as the on-campus batch. Let's pray and get into God's word. Let's pray together. Abba Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the revelation that your word brings to our hearts. Thank you, Father, for the truth in which you are establishing us, God, that we can rise up and be the people that you want us to be, God, in every aspect. Uh, Lord, once again, we give you glory. We give you praise and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're now at Acts chapter 3. We've seen how uh, the disciples waited for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and it actually happened. And then uh, they saw the birth of the early church. It all began in Acts chapter 2, when uh, the Holy Spirit was poured out suddenly. Peter stood up. He had an explanation for what happened, and he also preached Jesus. A wonderful response that we got from the people is they were cut to the heart. And then they asked Peter, like, what should we do? Uh, he talks about believing in the Lord Jesus and being baptized in water. And on the same day, all of them are baptized. So 3,000 people were added to the church body. From there, we saw the features of a believing community and saw how um, they were people of faith, they were people of prayer, they were people who were generous, they were giving to one another. Um, and uh, it was a, a, a wonderful demonstration of the work of God, the power of God among these people. Now, let's move on to Acts chapter 3. And Acts chapter 3 uh, has for us a miracle that took place, the healing of a lame man. Peter and John, you know, by now, uh, uh, they have already been ministering to the church and uh, they are functioning as apostles. And yet we see that they held on to some of their Jewish practices. They had faith uh, in God. They did not stop visiting the temple. So they've gone to the temple as usual. Uh, they went for prayer in the ninth hour, it says. So what is the ninth hour? When we look at the practice of prayer among the Jews, they had three times when they could enter the temple daily. One was in the morning around 9 a.m., which they call as the third hour. Once was um, at 3 at noon, which they call as the sixth hour, and 3 p.m., which they call as the ninth hour. So when we read ninth hour, it's roughly around 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Peter and John were on their way to pray. Was this an unusual uh, practice for them? No. We've already stated there were Jews. There were Jews who believed in Jesus, and yet they went to pray in the temple. Now, at the temple, there's something marvelous that took place. So we are going to look at, uh, I want to show you a picture. Yeah, I hope uh, oh, the on-campus people are not able to see, I suppose, right? The online uh, students can see it. You can see? Okay. So here is the picture. If you look at the picture here, we can see an outer coat of the temple area. And then we see an inner court. So the Jews went inside the inner court where they did their uh, praying. There's an entrance to that inner court. Uh, there are different entrances, but one of the entrance is what is known as the beautiful gate. It was called the beautiful gate because it was made out of uh, Corinthian brass. It was a very uh, sort of uh, uh, extravagant or um, expensive expensive gate which was made for the entrance at the temple so at one of the gates 
known as the beautiful gate. It's not the main gate of the temple area, but one of the gates, there was a man sitting and begging. So we are going to understand what happened to that particular person. At the same time, if you look at the picture, you can see a walkway there. It's called as Solomon's porch. It's a walkway. So that was the walkway where um, you know non-Jews could also kind of walk there. So they were allowed only till there. They cannot enter into, into the inner courts of the temple. So now you have an idea. You can, uh, when we study, you'll know. So there was a man sitting by the beautiful gate. And once he was healed, we will read about the Solomon's porch where he's kind of you know moving around and he's uh, rejoicing in God. So with this picture in mind, let's continue. I hope uh, you have all opened up the Bible for the sake of going at a faster pace. We are summarizing, but in the last two batches, we literally read every line of Acts. That's how we, we did it. Uh, but this time around, I'm trying to do it a little differently. So look at it, though. Look at the scripture. So Peter and John at the ninth hour, meaning 3 p.m., they go to the temple as usual. And there is a man sitting there. Lay, the scripture says, from his mother's womb. He can't walk. He's being carried there. He was at the gate beautiful. We all know where the gate beautiful is. What was he doing? Because he couldn't have a, a job and an income, he was begging. So he was asking for arms sitting over there. He looked at Peter and John and asked for arms. Now, when he, when he did that, verse 4 says, fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So there's a man. He's looking at Peter and John. Peter is looking back at him like eye to eye. That means he wants to uh, say something important. The man is looking. And now Peter is saying, he, uh, P Peter is fixing his eyes on him and saying, look at us. He was already looking at them. But intentionally, Peter is going to do something. That's why you know this moment has occurred. So in verse 5, this beggar, he gives his full attention to Peter. Why? A beggar would have had an expectation, isn't it? And that expectation is to receive something, maybe some money or some food, or we don't know what were the things that they actually gave them. So he must have hoped that, yeah, I'm going to get something from Peter. That's why he's saying, look at me. So he's looking at Peter. Then Peter says, verse 6, he says, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Okay. So he's telling the beggar or the this man who's begging. He's saying, I don't have money. But what I have, I give you. It's amazing. He didn't have money, but he had something, you know, you could say precious supernatural, wonderful, the power of God with him. And he's saying, I'll give you. Now, think about this. What if Peter and John said, OK, silver and gold we have. We don't have anything else. What is a better place to be? To have silver and gold or to have the power? Or Actually, both would be good, isn't it? <laughs> silver and gold also, and power also, all for the sake of the kingdom. All for the sake of the kingdom. But thank God that day, they didn't have money. But they had something. And that was the power of God. But we should not, like, at least it's a prayer. Like, I, whenever I read this, I remind myself, I should never be in the place where I say, I don't have the power of God. Okay, money comes and goes. But power of God should always be there. So that we can look at people and say, come, I'll pray for you. Anytime ready to pray. Anytime ready to minister. Anytime ready to flow in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Thank God, Peter and John that day, they were ready. Readiness for the sake of the gospel. They were ready. They were just walking into the temple, usual day. Routine is the same. Can God show up in our daily routine? He can. That's what happened. Daily routine. This man is only expecting money. 
which they don't have, but they say we have something which we give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So in the power of the name of Jesus, they command, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankles, ankle bones received strength. So uh, you remember those of us who were here for the afternoon sessions that day we saw a video how one of the sick people, you know, uh, someone is ministering, a man of God is ministering and supernaturally he just uh, holds them and they come out of the bed. There's a gift of faith. Imagine if they held this man and he didn't walk. It would be quite um, sad and even embarrassing for Peter and John. But that day, the gifts of the Holy Spirit were operational through Peter and John. What are some of those gifts? Gift of faith. They held the man. They know this man is lame from birth. But what does faith say? Doesn't matter. Come on, you can walk. Gift of faith. Right? Supernatural faith came into them that day. So they lifted him up. And the operation of healings and miracles, that's another gift of the Holy Spirit. So that was operating at that time. This man did not need healing. Healing is when you're sick. A normal uh, system or a body part is infected, is not functional. They need healing. But in this case, this man needed miracle. Because from childhood, he is not able to walk. We don't know what is the problem. But God probably recreated something that day for this man. That is something called as miracle. It's not healing. So there was a miracle. The operation of the gifts of healing and miracle was taking place. And this man actually got up. He got up that day. Uh, it was amazing. It was amazing. Verse 8 says, he leaping up stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping and praising God. There is a, uh, a video which all of you can watch in your free time, uh, Acts of the Apostles. They have um, uh, created, recreated the book of Acts verse by verse. I think it's the NKJV version. Whatever scriptures are here, they've tried to enact that. And uh, you can view it as a movie. It's a movie. It's available on many platforms, free of charge. So you can actually view it. Um, it's it's lovely. Like if you can watch that video, the young. It's all imagination. For imagine, forty years this man never walked. What will be his reaction? Okay, when we are doing something that we've always wanted to do and we could not do, in his case. How am I saying 40 years later we'll read? It is 40. 40 years he couldn't walk. And then, you know, you see in that video, he, he gets up, he can't contain his joy. He's, he's praising God, he's jumping, he doesn't know what to do. He's going in and out and all over the place, that outer court. He's running everywhere and people are looking at him. And they are surprised because faithful Jews were going to the temple every day. Some of them would have gone for 40 years also. Some of them 50 years, 60 years. They've always seen this man sitting in the temple begging, can't walk. The man who could not walk for these many years, for the first time. What will happen if we are the viewer or the onlooker when we notice, hey, this person could not walk. Today he's walking. Amazing, right? We're in amazement. What actually happened? So that was the situation in the temple area that day. A lame man who can walk is rejoicing. People who are watching him are also uh, amazed. And they are wondering. They are in wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So that's what we are seeing. So what happened on that day? A notable miracle took place at the gate, beautiful, by the power of God. So when a notable miracle takes place, okay, and people are amazed, what should Peter and John do? Everyone's looking now. Peter and John are in the limelight. Oh, these guys did something. This man couldn't walk. Today he's walking. What is Peter supposed to do? What is John supposed to do? What do you think? What should they do? What should we do? When miracles are happening and people are looking at us, we prayed, miracle happened. What to do now? 
share the gospel great wonderful yeah so that's what we should do we should take that opportunity to point people to jesus and that's the lesson peter gave us that day so what he did verse 12 he says men of israel why do you marvel at this or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk you remember earlier when the uh, man was looking at them what did peter say in verse 4 he said look at us he told this man look at us verse 4 now verse 12 he is saying why are you looking at us look at peter's response when he wanted to minister the miracle he told that man look at me look at us when the miracle happened he saying don't look at me why are you looking at me i didn't do this jesus did it god did it this happened by the power in the name of jesus so it's a big lesson for us when the supernatural works of god are done we should not draw attention to ourselves that's how the apostles uh, did the work of god when a notable miracle took place and it's evident people are in amazement all around everybody knows what happened peter saying don't look at us as if we did this no don't give us the glory we are just human beings just like you so they are so sorted in their minds and they are so level headed that they never drew attention to themselves and we should remember that as children of god and ministers of god don't draw attention to yourself um and uh, he goes on to talk about the lord jesus and uh, you know he says that this jesus this jesus and he talks about he says many things about jesus you know he uh, says um, glorified his servant jesus meaning jesus was a minister of god remember francis said when a miracle happens we should preach christ share the gospel that's exactly what he's doing one point he says don't look at us it's not for our glory it's we have not done it second look to jesus who is jesus he's sharing different things the servant of our god and um, he says you delivered him to pilot you know you uh, killed him and he also says in verse 14 Jesus is the holy one and the just so these are all we can recognize the character of god or the nature of god by peter's description he is quite bold when a jew says someone is holy holy one that only refers to yahweh boldly peter is saying the holy one jesus that means jesus is the messiah he is preaching jesus as the messiah servant of our god holy one just he says a god of justice and also he says you killed the prince of life isn't that doesn't that sound funny how can one kill the prince of life because life is in him how can we afflict him with death so he is calling jesus prince of life life comes from jesus and what did the people try to do kill jesus it never worked it did not work so he says you kill the prince of life whom god raised from the dead of which we are witnesses and he is so bold he says look jesus did not remain dead but he rose from the dead and the beautiful thing is peter john they were eye witnesses this is not a second hand information first hand information they were very much there when they were interacting with the risen christ so peter is saying jesus is the messiah we are witnesses that he rose from the dead and without any confusion without any confusion directly he says in verse 16 and his name through faith in his name has made this man strong whom you see and know yes the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all so he's saying do you want to know how this man 
is healed or experienced a miracle? Faith in the name of Jesus. Power of the name of Jesus has made this man whole. That's how he is healed now. So he's giving an explanation. And then he's exalting the Lord Jesus. Um, he is also telling people exactly how this man was healed. So that's what we have observed. Now, I just want to ask a question. Why is it that this man was healed on this particular day, not on any other day? We said Jews are going to the temple every day. Jesus, Jesus also went to the temple every day, right? He was devout in his uh, uh, worship. Why didn't Jesus heal this man? Why 40 years he was still sitting there? Why only today? Any idea? Peter and John went the previous day also, we are sure, because daily they went to the temple. Why not yesterday? Why today? Any answers? Okay, let me look at the chat. Okay, no answers. Um, see, faith was always there, faith in the name of Jesus. This miracle could have happened anytime. But what we we can say is that the gifts of the Spirit were operational at that time. And uh, we pointed out, right, two, two gifts of the Spirit, gift of faith, healings and miracles. It was operational at that point, which is what Peter could sense. And he moved with what the Holy Spirit was doing. So the uh, miracle took place in that moment and not in any other moment. So which is why we say it's so important for us to hear from God. You know, the what is God doing? What is God saying? And then flow with it. So at that point, he sensed that this is what God wanted. And he moved with it. And it happened. Okay. So uh, that could be the reason why it uh, took a while. Okay. Now, let's continue. So here is Peter. He is pointing people to Jesus. And he's also talking about salvation in Jesus Christ. He said till now who Jesus is, that he's the Messiah. He's just, holy one, the servant of God, uh, and uh, also prince of life. He continues to talk about Jesus. And he says, God foretold about this Jesus through the mouth of his prophets. And it has now been fulfilled. So why is he speaking like that? He's talking to a Jewish audience. And the Jewish audience know the context. They know the scriptures. So he wants to explain to them that these are the very scriptures that are speaking about the Lord Jesus. And it has been fulfilled. And he calls them to repentance. Look, when we are preaching the gospel, there has to be an action on the part of the listeners. What is that action? Repent and be baptized. We saw in the first sermon of Peter, he did that. Repent and be baptized. So after he's telling them about Jesus and how it's aligned to the Jewish scriptures, he says, repent, verse 19. Repent, therefore, and be converted. What is converted? Converted is not about changing religion. That's not what it means. The uh, text there, if you go down to uh, you know, learning about that word, it's about changing our mind. It's about transformation. Okay. So what happens when we repent? We repent and then experience 
a life transformation that is a real testimony anyone who is truly accepted christ has experienced a transformation there has been a change from the way we used to live uh, attached to the things of the world and sin right so that's what he's talking about he's talking about a transformation of life in christ it's not about change of a religion change of a religion i mean it may or may not affect the person but that's not what this word means repent and be transformed let your let your heart and mind turn around right so that your life can turn around that's the uh, that's what he is calling the people to so repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so what is the message when we repent when we accept god's transforming work in our lives we will also experience forgiveness of sins how can sins be blotted out you know that uh, jews they had the temple practices every day they were sacrificing every day they were shedding blood with the hope that god's wrath would be um, you know uh, abated and that uh, they they will be accepted by god that was their practice but today peter is preaching about forgiveness of sins he's saying look in what christ has done what jesus has done you know the perfect lamb of god the book of hebrews talks about it you know, perfect sacrifice one time sacrifice your sins if you repent your sins may be blotted away blotted out but fully removed or in other words you will experience forgiveness and he also says times of refreshing may come from the presence of the lord what are times of refreshing times of refreshing can be understood as the baptism of the holy spirit the outpouring of the holy spirit so that we can experience the holy spirit being poured out on us okay so that is how one experiences uh, uh, you know one one receives salvation and experiences the power of god through salvation so he's preaching about jesus and then action i need you to repent repent be converted uh, so that your sins may be blotted out and you may receive times of refreshing uh, and uh, in this way you know he calls people to uh, to christ and he also continues in his message to uh, touch upon the fact that jesus is a prophet like moses so that's truly giving a very high position to jesus before the jews moses was uh, highly regarded and honored by the jews so when uh, peter is saying that jesus is like the prophet moses it's a huge statement for the jews like oh come on how can you compare jesus of nazareth with moses but peter is doing it is selling them he's a prophet like moses and uh, and also you know the fact that um, there is a promise that god made to abraham that through abraham all the families in the world will be blessed so how are the families in the world going to be blessed through the seed of abraham and he's pointing to jesus as the seed he's saying look it is jesus through whom every family every home is going to be blessed it's all about jesus so it's like a proper sermon of peter once again pointing people to christ uh, speaking from the scriptures establishing to them that jesus is the messiah okay so this is what peter does at the end of uh, this supernatural miracle are there any questions or anything that you just wanted to discuss before we jump into acts chapter 4 okay so shall we just move on great now the miracle has taken place what kind of uh, treatment do you think peter and john expected after this they've done a good work what is that going and demonstrating uh, god's power a man who couldn't walk for so long is now happy people also are amazed it's a good work so maybe now they should go home spend some time in worship and just enjoy god's presence thank god that's what we are expecting isn't it but what actually happens let's look at that in acts chapter 
Now, when Peter is speaking to the people, verse 1 of Acts 4 says, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. Came upon them means the leaders at that point are against what is happening because they look at it like a, a conspiracy against the government or conspiracy against the leadership. That these people are trying to grab the attention of the Jews and this may lead. You see how, how um, in, in politics, they, maybe their mindset was like, we need the people's approval. Now, if another group is taking the people's approval, who knows, tomorrow they can become more popular and what if the power shifts? There are all kinds of things that can take place. So they are thinking politically. And when they notice the, uh, uh, you know, the attention of the people is going to Peter and John, they get angry and they come upon them. Come upon them means like go in a hurry and grab them. Okay. Uh, they were the the leaders they were greatly disturbed it says disturbed by what they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead and also notice it says the Sadducees Sadducees are people who don't believe in the resurrection so obviously the teaching was uh, disturbing to them and they wanted to stop what was going on so they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day. So this has happened at 3 p.m. So all are rejoicing. We don't know how many hours Peter preached, but it's already dark. The leaders have grabbed Peter and John. They cannot try them because it's the end of the day. The courts will be open the next day. The office will be open the next day. So they just keep them in custody. So now they are in custody. What a uh, tough situation for Peter and John. That day when they were going to the temple, they would not have imagined that they're going to spend the night in the jail. Okay, but they are now in the jail. One good thing that people could rejoice in was because of this miracle, you know, uh, others started believing. Others started believing. Look at verse 4 there. It says, however, many of those who heard the word believed. And the number of the men came to be about 5,000. So people were being added to the church. Even though Peter and John are jailed, the word worked in their lives. And the church of Jerusalem, how much was it in uh, Acts chapter 2? End of Acts chapter 2? 3,120. Now, about 5,000 people. The congregation has grown. Uh, I don't know how they did their services, but yeah, it's a huge number. Uh, but we also saw, right, they were meeting house to house and in the temple and different places and having their fellowship. The community has grown um, even by the demonstration of this miracle and the preaching of Peter. Now, what happens next? It is the next day, next day. And the rulers, the elders, the scribes, they're all gathered together. So there is um, this council of elders. Uh, I mean, all these groups, not just the elders, all these people put together, it's called as a Sanhedrin. So that's the team that um, presides over these cases. So they've all come together and there is a high priest by the name of um, Annas and other men. Th their names are all mentioned there. Uh, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, uh, and they were all gathered together. So Peter and John are here and the Sanhedrin is here. Okay. The Sanhedrin is upset with them because for them it feels like a conspiracy. These men are trying to mislead the people and who knows, quickly they might uh, take power into their hands and we will lose our power. So that's the fear that they have. So with Peter and John standing in front of them, they start the interrogation, questioning them, questioning them. So what was the question? Verse 7, they said, by what power or by what name have you done this? That's the question. Who gave you authority? In other words. They were 
with the authority of Caesar. Who gave you authority? Tell us. Which government gave you authority to do this? That's the way they are questioning them. Now, Peter, verse 8. Okay, beautiful verse. It says, Peter is responding. Okay, persecution is happening. They are being questioned. How is Peter answering? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Amazing, isn't it? When we have to give an answer. And especially in a tough situation like this, what to say? They are questioning us. We don't know what to say. But Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. And thank God Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. Not just in his own strength, but filled with the Holy Spirit. He spoke that day. Remember, Jesus promised, right, in um, Matthew 10, if we go back and read that, Matthew 10, verses 17 to 20, Jesus told them, look, there will come times when they will deliver, uh, deliver you up to the councils and uh, scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Matthew 10 verses 17 to 20. How amazing. When we find ourselves in places where people are trying to catch us for doing the work of God. Jesus promised it's going to happen. Don't be surprised. There can be some difficult situations. But when you don't know what to say, the Spirit of God will put the words in our mouth. Amen. And that day it happened. Verse 8 of Acts 4. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke to them. So he addresses them and he asks them, what kind of logic is this? You know, in verse 9 he says, uh, we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man. By what means he has been made well? So he's saying, you're questioning us. What is his logic? For a good deed, you're questioning us? There was a helpless man. So many years he couldn't walk. He's walking now. Is that the crime? That uh, you, know, you, you are uh, convicting us with? Reasonable question, isn't it? They didn't do anything evil. Now, if they had stolen or if they had uh, uh, murdered or if they had uh, spoken something against the law, something against the government or uh, created some trouble, you know, some mob violence, then if they stand in front of the council, makes sense. But Peter is asking them, we helped a he Helpless man, for that you're questioning us. In whose name you did a good job? He's literally like asking the council this question. Okay. But he's not afraid. In verse 10, he says, okay, direct answer to your question. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man stands here before you whole. So what was their question? By whose name? What is the answer? Jesus of Nazareth. By the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He stands today. And he also says, you crucified him. You remember Jesus of Nazareth just, you know, some years ago? Through him, he is standing before you. And verse 12, powerful verse there again. He says, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So he's talking about the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is that stone, that uh, chief cornerstone. And salvation is available only in the name of Jesus. So boldly, boldly, he is giving an answer to 
the question of the council. So what was the response of the council? They're looking at Peter and John. Oh my goodness, look how they talk. <laughs> okay, they're giving the answer as Jesus of Nazareth. They're not even afraid. So immediately the response of the, uh, the council is, actually they noticed, verse 13 says, they saw the boldness of Peter and John. Same Peter, he ran away, remember? When Jesus is going to be crucified. But now, what is the council noticing in this man? Boldness. Where is he getting this boldness from? And also, maybe the language in which they spoke, it is said that the Galileans had a certain accent. So he would have spoken in that accent. And uh, the council realizes, oh, these are uneducated people, you know, untrained, uneducated people. But how is he so bold? Okay, he's not been to college, he's not been to university, he doesn't have a PhD, doesn't have a job. How is he so bold? Like that, uh, you know, they perceive that these men are bold. And they even state these uneducated and untrained men, and they are amazed. But you know what verse 13 says? They realized that they had been with Jesus. So how did these uneducated men become so bold? Because they were with Jesus. Boldness comes from being with Jesus. So they were able to stand up that day in a very difficult situation. So what does this tell us? Does it tell us that uh, we need to be untrained and uneducated? Is that the emphasis of the scripture? Not necessarily. Right? Uh, education is not bad. Uh, training is not bad. It's great. If you take, for example, Apostle Paul, he was a trained, educated man. But God worked through Paul's life as well. You have people like Peter and John, you know, fishermen. But God worked through his life. So it's not about, you know, our background. Anybody can be bold. As long as we are filled with the Holy Spirit, as long as we've been with Jesus. So that's a lesson for us, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Being with Jesus will bring the boldness we need to live for Christ and do what God is calling us to do. So at this point, I'm just going to stop. Uh, we have uh, some more further. We are going to see you know, how uh, the Sanhedrin really decides regarding uh, Peter and John and you know what and all happens. Uh, but for now, no, we've seen that miracles are working through the lives of the apostles. And even when danger occurs, God is with them, helping them, guiding them. And, uh, you know, they are able to respond to the questions. So uh, is there any anything from today's discussion that really touched your heart? Whether chapter 3 or chapter 4, you can please share. Online students, please feel free. OK, maybe I'll, uh, Chira, you want to say something? <laughs> OK. You can, if you want. Okay, fine. I'll just summarize it. You share. Whenever we get a chance to speak about Jesus, we should be bold and speak Yes, yes. Okay. So whenever we get a chance uh, from Acts um, 3 and, oh yeah, Acts 3, we should, we should be bold and speak. So that's uh, an insight there. That's true. It's true. I think for me, I, every time I read Acts chapter 3, I feel happiness again. You know, that man got healed. <laughs> it's amazing. He couldn't walk 40 years. And that day he was walking. I, I don't know how he felt. The joy that he felt that day. Each time I read chapter 3, I feel his joy. And uh, I, I know we can't fully grasp it. But uh, how amazing you know, that God works like this in our lives that 
our expectation in him by his power he meets those expectations and it's uh, amazing we have such a good god so that always blesses my heart anything else okay jackin is uh, sharing she says spending time more in his presence has strengthened my faith and given me boldness to share the gospel either through uh, text messages or speaking out god's word praise god thank you jackin it's like how they said no these men have been with jesus and that's where they are bold so when we are also with jesus his word and his presence we can move with boldness wonderful thank you so much all right so uh, please take time uh, you can go back and read chapter 3 chapter 4 and uh, please read ahead as well chapter 5 and 6 we'll see in some classes the pace will be very slow in some classes it may be faster uh, but depending on you know uh, the the what the holy spirit wants to impress on our hearts will dwell uh, a little longer on on some sections uh, but please do read please to read at least till acts chapter 6 and uh, then we will you know uh, let you know to read further so right now let's pray and close uh, i want to request uh, one of us to please pray either in class or online okay shri radha spring father god we thank you for this time thank you for this day and uh, as we learn so many things and you reveal so many things by your holy spirit it may build our foundation in you god we surrender everything into your hand the rest of the week into your hand god in jesus name we pray amen 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 thank you shri radha and thank you everyone god bless you have a good uh, weekend we will meet again on monday